Can I welcome everyone to the 20th meeting of 2014 of the Public Audit Committee. Uh, can I remind members to set any electronic devices to silent or flight mode so that it doesn't interfere with the recording equipment? Um, Sandra White um, is replacing David Torrance today. David's given his apologies. Um, and Sandra White's here as a substitute. Sandra, can I invite you to declare any interest? Thank you. Give you no interest to declare. Thank you. Um, Ken McIntosh uh, will be joining us later, and I know Nigel Don has another meeting to go to at some point, but he will be back. Okay. Um, first item on our agenda is can we agree to take item five in private? Okay. Thank you. Um, second item, uh, we have a section 23 report, preparations for the implementation of the Scotland Act 2012. And the Auditor General is today joined by Gordon Smale, who's Senior Manager, um, Rebecca <coughs> Seidel, who's the Project Manager, and Mark Taylor, the Assistant Director of Audit Scotland. Auditor General, can I invite you to make some comments? Thank you, the report I'm bringing to the committee today looks at the Scottish Government's progress in preparing for the financial measures in the Scotland Act 2012. This includes the introduction of the two new devolved taxes, new borrowing and cash management powers, and a Scottish rate of income tax. Before I set out what we found, I'd like to highlight two important points. First, establishing the arrangements for these new powers is a large and complex task. It includes developing an overall approach to devolved tax and the legislative framework to implement it. The Scottish Government has successfully developed a legislative framework for the devolved taxes through three bills that have been passed by the Scottish Parliament. Second, the changes that come into force next year through the Scotland Act are even more significant when set within the context of the recent report by the Smith Commission and the Heads of Agreement on Further Financial Powers for the Scottish Parliament. My report focuses on the preparations for administering the two new devolved taxes, the Land and Building Transaction Tax and the Scottish Landfill Tax, which come into effect from April next year. It also provides some initial observations on progress towards introducing the Scottish Rate of Income Tax. It's important to note that the audit was carried out while preparations for the implementation of the Act are ongoing. Given the scale and the importance of the changes, I felt it was important to review progress at this stage before the new powers come into effect next year. The report does acknowledge that substantial activity is continuing within the Scottish Government. Convener, I'll now briefly summarise my findings under three headings. First of all, on the devolved taxes, we found that the Scottish Government has established clear structures for managing the setup of the new tax authority, Revenue Scotland, and now has well-developed plans for implementing the devolved taxes. But the staff needed to manage the overall programme were not in place early enough, and there were also delays in procuring the IT system to collect and, and administer the devolved taxes. That's reduced the time available to develop the IT system and to appoint staff to Revenue Scotland's operational team. As a result, there is increased risk that the IT system may not be fully operational by the 1st of April and that Revenue Scotland may not have the required expertise fully in place to, develop, to manage the devolved taxes effectively when they come into force. This could result in tax payments taking longer to process and lead to an increase in processing costs. To be clear, convener, I'm not saying that nothing will be ready in time, but that there is more risk of things not being fully in place, resulting in the need for short-term alter alternative arrangements with potential implications for costs and performance. Revenue Scotland is fully aware of these issues and is taking steps to manage them. The report makes some short-term recommendations for Revenue Scotland, and in particular we'd like to see it closely monitoring the development of the IT system and recruitment to its operational team. This will help it to decide whether to implement its contingency plans to ensure it's in a position to manage the devolved taxes effectively from April next year. Second, on the Scottish rate of income tax, we found that the Scottish Government is working closely with Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs to prepare for the Scottish rate of income tax's introduction in April 2016. We've highlighted that the Scottish Government needs to make sure it has enough appropriately skilled people in place to support the successful implementation of these new responsibilities in 2016. And finally, on financial management, we found that the Scottish Government is working to incorporate the financial aspects of the Scotland Act powers within its financial management arrangements. 
the new financial powers that the Scotland Act 2012 introduces and the prospect of further powers following the Smith Commission's report have got significant implications for Scotland's public finances. All this makes the need for comprehensive, transparent, reliable and timely financial reporting even more important. I plan to publish an update report on the progress the Scottish Government is making in developing its financial reporting early next year and will continue to keep this area under close review. As always, convenient, convener, my colleagues and I are happy to answer the committee's questions. Okay. Thank you for that, Mr. General. I don't think we can underestimate some of the complexities involved in setting up a, a completely new tax collection system. And I suppose we shouldn't <coughs> underestimate the both historical and political significance of this, uh, particularly when we look at uh, what lies ahead as well. So we all need to get this right. We need to prove that both the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament uh, is competent in handling uh, tax collection. Um, could you say, Auditor General, that your report is now dated or does it have continued relevance? Um, the audit work um, on which the report is based, as we say in the report, was completed in early November. Um, we've been looking at it throughout the period of 2014, and the team can give you more detail about that. Um, with any report, there comes a point where we have to draw a line and draw our conclusions and go into the process of agreeing it for factual accuracy. Um, so as at early November, the report is fully up to date. Um, I think in these circumstances, we know that Revenue Scotland and the government have been working very hard since then uh, to overcome some of the problems that are identified in the report, um, and I'm sure there'll be more progress that they can report to you later on. Okay. So you completed your report in early November. Um, you published it, I think, on the 11th of December. Um, and the normal process is that you give uh, a private copy to uh, those concerned to make comments. So in this case, presumably, Scottish Government, Revenue Scotland... Um, so they were issued with the, the opportunity to make private comment? Yes, Convener. We always make sure that our reports are agreed for factual accuracy to avoid this committee having to um, arbitrate in disagreements between us and the people that we're auditing. Um, the team will keep me straight, but in this case I think it was uh, agreed for factual accuracy fully with Scottish Government and Revenue Scotland, and sections were cleared with uh, SEPA registers of Scotland and right. the Scottish Fiscal Commission. So, so between early November and the 11th of December, those concerned had the opportunity to challenge the accuracy of anything <coughs> which you said or whether it gave a, a wrong interpretation or analysis. Um, did the, was the wording of the final report challenged by any of those concerned? Um, it's very normal for us to make uh, minor changes to the wording to make sure we're fully reflecting the situation at the point the report is agreed, and that was the case with this report as it is with but most. But when, when you reached that final wording, there was no further <laughs> challenge to, to those final words? No. Uh, I think it's important to distinguish between factual accuracy and the conclusions I draw from them. But in terms of factual accuracy, yes, the report sure. was fully agreed. So would you say that um, your comments um, about readiness and uh, being a, there had been a risk that the, the full IT system would not be in place in time, um, would that be a positive comment or a negative comment or a, or a comment of concern? Or if I was asking you to say in terms of red, green and amber, um, how would you assess the readiness of the, the IT system at that point? I think, as we say in the report, Convener, the um, progress that was made on developing and testing the IT system and on appointing the staff who will be needed to administer the new taxes, um, progress at that point was behind where the Scottish Government and Revenue Scotland had planned it to be. Um, we do know there's a significant amount of work going on to um, remedy those delays, and the Government has told us that they are confident that things will be in place at the 1st of April. Um, that's why I've reported in the terms that I have that there is a, an increased risk um, that things may not be fully in place, but also reflecting the fact that contingency plans are there to make sure the taxes will be able to be collected come the 1st of April. So, so things um, 
been behind schedule, progress not being made, and there being a risk. If, if I was asking you to assess that as either being a positive or a negative, um, how would you assess that? I think it's clear that um, the Government and Revenue Scotland would prefer to have been able to fulfil the plans as they were originally set out. Um, we all want to see these new taxes working on the 31st of March, um, but as I said in my introductory remarks, what I'm not saying at this point is, is that it won't be possible to collect them, simply right. that there is a risk that contingency plans will need to be put in place and that that could have cost and performance implications. So the date that you produced your report and then sent it to the parties concerned could you say to this committee this morning that at that point um, you would have nothing negative to, to comment on, that it was all positive? No, I think as, as my report says, what I've reported is that there is an increased risk that the system may not be fully in place as planned come the 1st of April. Um, but I'm, I'm certainly not saying that the Government and Revenue Scotland won't be in a position to collect the taxes at that point. So, so at that point there were some concerns... <coughs> At that point, you were worried that there was a lot of work to be done um, and would it be fair to say that things weren't necessarily on track at that time? I think it might be helpful for me to refer the committee to Exhibit 3 on page 14 of the report, Convener, um, which shows um, in an exhibit the uh, progress made in implementing the IT system to deliver the Volv taxes. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see what the government originally planned, and on the right-hand side, you can see what actually happened in practice. Um, it's clear from that that progress was slower than planned, um, and as we say in the report, as a result of those delays, uh, Revenue Scotland and the government have been developing contingency plans that they hope, first of all, they hope they won't need to use, but secondly, that they believe will be able to deliver the um, devolved taxes on the 1st of April if needed. But if there's nothing negative to report uh, from between early November and when your report was published, how, how can you then say in the report that the delays have increased the risk that the IT system may not be fully functioning by the 1st of April and that Revenue Scotland won't have the required operational expertise in place by then. So either that statement is wrong or the statement that there is nothing negative to report is wrong. Which would it be? I, I think... I think what I need to make clear is that the audit work was completed in early November. I don't have evidence that I can bring to this committee in the way that I normally would about what's happened since then. Um, you may well want to explore that with your next panel yeah. of witnesses, but my evidence tells you that as at the beginning of November, these delays um, had uh, materialised and they led to an increased risk. Yeah, and, and between that point in November and the publication of your report, none of the agencies or organisations concerned came back to you with further evidence to say that events have now changed and everything is now uh, back in track, fully functioning. They have accepted, um, after comment, the, the details of your report. They accept that the report's factually accurate as at the date we sent it to them for clearance convenience. Right. OK. Um, Mary Scanlon? Yes. Could, <coughs> could I just follow that uh, line of questions for a, a second? Um, between the first week in November and the Audit Scotland report on the 11th of December, we had Eleanor Emerson and John King um, at uh, the Finance Committee. And uh, Eleanor Emerson, we have a small number of amber indicators out of two dozen, but we've been working hard to turn them to green. We've got nothing at red. Ross is confident that we have everything in place that will support effective delivery. And John King, the system has already been delivered and tested and it's available to Revenue Scotland IT uh, team to use. That was to the Finance Committee and I know they'll be asking questions later today. Now that's a very confident uh, delivery to the Finance Committee given that uh, Auditor General, if I may say, your report is telling us of an increased risk. Now, <laughs> so between, say, the 7th of November and the 11th of December, at a date between those two dates, we have confidence and assurance to this Parliament's Finance Committee, everything is wonderful. So what happened, given what the convener's been asking, 
that these organisations agreed to your report, which is highly critical, it's very concerning to both finance and audit committees in this parliament. So why was such a glorified, confident pitch given to the finance committee? Everything was in order, and then we received this today. I think all I can do, Mrs Scanlon, is to um, repeat that the conclusions in my report are based on the audit work we carried out up until early November, um, and I'm confident that the conclusions I've drawn in it about the increased risks to successful delivery of the new taxes reflect all of the evidence that was available to us. Um, I think for development since then, you will need to ask colleagues from the Scottish Government and Revenue Scotland about the work they're doing and the basis for their confidence from there. If I may say, I have absolutely no doubt and I, I, I do not lack confidence in any way of the accuracy of the Audit Scotland report. Um, but as a member of this committee <laughs> charged with the duties that we are charged with, I have to say I was shocked to read your report two weeks after this confident delivery that everything was in order and you're seeing increased risks. So I think that's perhaps for the next panel. Could I perhaps go back to the report you gave us in uh, 2012, Managing ICT Contracts, which looked at ROS, uh, this report here. And you did highlight August 2012. You highlighted, it's uh, an old report, but it's uh, page nine, um, as uh, the, the, the Scottish Government provided limited support. You were quite critical that the Scottish Government had failed to support the organisations, including Rose. So it's quite shocking that, again, today we have your report, 11th of uh, December 2014, and I quote from paragraph 30. Um, it explored uh, the option to develop the IT system fully within the Scottish Government. This was rejected at the end of April 2014, as the Scottish Government didn't have the staff or expertise available to develop the system within the timescales due to other commitments. What was the Scottish Government doing that was more important than preparing to collect taxes, more devolved taxes in Scotland? What was more important? Can you tell us what these other commitments were? Because this was flagged up two years earlier. We're currently carrying out work that will be reported in 2015 following up the report you're referring to there, um, looking at the overall progress government is making with its management of large IT systems. Um, but the committee will be aware that I have brought a couple of other reports um, to this committee recently looking at the challenges that the government is still facing in that area, um, the uh, Agricultural Futures Programme and NHS 24. Um, and I think it's fair to say that government as a whole, not just in Scotland, but much more widely, does face problems in having the appropriate <laughs> skills and resources to develop these big systems. Um, I think what we have seen here in relation to the new tax powers um, has been a, a detailed process of making the decision about whether the best course of action is to develop it in-house or to go externally. Um, that decision was taken later than originally planned, um, but at this stage we have no concerns that the decision to go externally wasn't the right one to make sure that the system could be in place quickly given the other competing de demands that are around. Um, the committee will be aware that, for example, the agricultural futures system um, is also one that brings with it a great deal of financial risk um, and there is always a prioritising process going on to decide what's the best approach given the competing demands that exist. Well, I'm sorry to be a little bit boring and I appreciate that... Uh, but on, yeah, I'm now becoming one of the older members of this committee, so I have a, a, a bit of a bulky filing system in my office. But I have something here from Paul Gray, and it was in response to your managing ICT contracts, and it's dated October 2012. And uh, he's setting up delivery of public services, um, an organisation called SWAN and an action plan in central government ICT workforce to be available for consultation across the sector, gateway reviews every six months, and uh, um, here we are, the Scottish Wide Area Network ICT programme. 
I mean, we were told on this committee that we would never again, the smaller organisations like, like uh, Ross, Disclosure Scotland, Crown Office Procurator, they would not be left to languish on their own. We were told that the government would take charge of that. That was two years ago. And all these wonderful systems and help and advice was all going to be available. And uh, naively, we actually took all that at face value. And two years, more than two years later, we're sitting back saying government didn't have time to sort it out, despite everything we were told. What's happened to this big government advisory service to help organisations such as Ross? And I, just... I think the decision that was taken in January of this year to give Revenue Scotland a more central role in collecting um, the two new taxes that are due next year um, was very much a reflection and a recognition of the fact that the resources available in, Rev in registers of Scotland and in SEPA um, were limited and that it might be difficult for them to do what was required. So that decision to give Revenue Scotland a more central role reflected those challenges. Um, there was then the decision to be made about whether the IT system should be developed in-house or procured externally and Mark what may want to say more about the way in which that decision was taken yeah, if I could just pick up on, on, uh, with, with the starting point for the decision to have a single IT system largely based on Revenue Scotland that was a, that was a move from from uh, initial thinking which was to have uh, a number of systems one in C, one in SEPA one in Re uh, registers of Scotland and instead to bring those systems together although uh, the assessment of capacity was uh, something that was taken into account. And the main driver from, for that, as we understand, was a look to the future and a look to, to the fact that in the event that there may be further uh, taxes that are, are devolved to Scotland, and the Smith Commission, of course, has proposed that, that, pr that having a single centralised IT system that would be able to accommodate those taxes in the future was the way to go, and that was the core of that decision. And we certainly don't have any concerns with the nature of that decision. It was subsequent to that in terms of the timing to get from that decision the initial plan was can we build that or this system ourselves I think we can then an understanding that given the range of IT activity that was on in the government I need to go outside to procure that resource and our, our, our uh, the issue that we raise in the report is in relation to the time between understanding that there wasn't sufficient capacity in-house to the procurement decision being taken and the procurement arrangements being being put in place and that that has squeezed the time available for development of the system. I think in, com in comparison to, uh, as, as the Auditor General says, we will have a, a more rounded look at IT and, and how government is managing IT in the new year. In relation to this particular project, I think the, the issue that we flag in the report in relation to this particular pro project is about that time delay between understanding the need to get that external resource in and the decision to get the external, external resource in, and that squeezed the time available. Well, I've just got one more question, but I would like to say that twice you've highlighted that Registers of Scotland have asked the government for help. October 2012, they chapped on the door and there was nothing. Limited support. Again, they go and chap on the door. Please, can you help us? We've been given an assurance that all the expertise and support is there. The chap on the door, and this time the government says, sorry, but we've got other commitments. So my final question, convener, is why has the cost of setting up uh, Revenue Scotland risen from 16 to oh, 21,000, I think? Oh, wait a minute, it's here somewhere. Uh, tw 21 million, 16 to 20. 20 or 21, sorry. I'll ask Gordon to talk you through the figures to keep us straight. So the, 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 uh, the explanations in paragraph 37 and 38 of the report. So there was an initial amount of um, 16.7 million over the seven years. But as you can see through the, the, the uh, story there in the report, uh, what happened was over time there was uh, reassessments of what would actually be involved in the job of collecting the taxes and supporting the new tax administration over time. So that gave rise to an increase. Um, if we then move to 38, uh, there's some detail in there about the, um, the amount, how, how amounts have increased over the period. Um, so, if the, the bottom line, if you like, is the rise set up costs totalling 4.3 million as opposed to um, the 3.2 million that were expected over those two years, but the, the, the set up costs are now over three years. 
So there's explanation in there as to as to as to why the amounts have gone up. Right. Well, uh, again, I was boringly sitting in the Parliament to hear our uh, finance secretary say that. Um, the operational cost doing it through the Scottish Government uh, will be at least 25% lower than it would be had I asked HMRC to deliver the status quo. Through Revenue Scotland, we will serve the needs of the people of Scotland at a lower cost than the UK set up. So the costs have now risen 16.7 to 21. So instead of 25% less, it's, uh, it's almost just about a million less than the 22 from HMRC. So why did the Finance Secretary say the set-up cost would be 25% less than HMRC and we're now less than a million? Uh, we're, we're very close, by the time it's set up, we're actually very close to what HMRC... So, you know, I can't imagine he would wish to mislead the Parliament. So why, you know, was this commitment given... And it's changed so much. Our understanding is that the Finance Secretary statement was based on the original estimates provided by both the Scottish Government and HMRC for administering the devolved taxes. Two million, but he was going to do it cheaper. Yes. 25% cheaper. At, at that point, I think both the Scottish Government and HMRC produced estimates of what the costs would be, um, for which the Scottish Government costs were lower. Um, we've now seen the increase you've highlighted in the Scottish Government's costs. What we don't know, of course, is what would have happened to HMRC's costs over the same period. Um, so I'm not in a position to um, comment further on whether that there is still a difference between them. Or Scottish Government realistic in their... Uh, estimate of 25% uh, less than HMRC, it's now 5% less than HMRC. It, it's very clear that the changes have come from the government's experience of going through um, the process of establishing a tax authority for the first time. Um, we simply don't know what the counterfactual would have been had HMRC been asked to do the work, I'm afraid. Um, I'm going to bring Colin Keir and, and then Tavis Scott. Can I just say to members that we might have to squeeze uh, their contributions because the next panel of uh, witnesses have to be at the Finance Committee for 11.30, so we'll need to work within those times. <coughs> so, Colin. Okay. <coughs> uh, thanks very much, convener, and good morning. Uh, it seems to me that... Um, in terms of what's been said about the report, I think it's been overtaken by events to a certain extent. Um, and there's actually quite a lot of good stuff in it. I'm, I, I see it as a fairly positive uh, report. The two issues, of course, are in terms of staffing and IT. I think there's perhaps ongoing difficulties we'll have with the audit uh, function in terms of um, the rate of income tax. Uh, that, that we've already, as a committee, been talking about over a period of months due to the fact it's not uh, Audit Scotland who are the main functionary uh, here. But if, um, uh, if I can say, heading back to uh, uh, page 13, uh, Exhibit 3, there's something actually in terms of the fact that we've heard from the First Minister in, the, in an answer to Mr Rennie uh, uh, last week and what we've heard so far. And looking at this very, very helpful uh, graph here, I think it's actually quite um, illuminating that obviously between the January and April um, period whereby the, uh, the decision initially had been to keep it in-house before realising for whatever reason uh, it was actually better to go external, that's been made. The revision in the plans appear to be moving forward at the point, obviously, that you've taken in your report. You have some uh, concerns, which I think, in terms of what's been said recently, are allaying these concerns. But it's heartening to see that we haven't gone down a situation in perhaps some of the other IT projects, uh, particularly uh, the, some of the major ones that have gone way over budget, where they've ploughed on regardlessly. Uh, at the beginning, just to realise later on with the cost implications that have uh, subsequently occurred. So there's something heartening here about the fact that the revised plan would appear to be more or less on track. Every IT system, as we know, has a, 
a, a, a risk <laughs> somewhere along the lines. And uh, I'm actually very heartened by a lot of what's in here because it's identified and it's taking forward. So given the fact that we are looking retrospectively and uh, we have the obviously the, the issues of staff, which I think is a very clear answer from the First Minister uh, on Thursday on that. Um, and you say there's a risk. How, perhaps taking it off the, the, the report at the moment, but at this moment in time, from what you've heard in the past few weeks and the various answers, would you say that the risk is uh, the same as perhaps it was at the point where you were writing this report, or do you see a lightening of that load because the First Minister was fairly clear that although there's contingencies, um, there's no intention of using them at this time because of the work that's been done. I, I don't think I can answer that question, Mr Keir. We, um, we stake our reputation on credible work that's grounded in the audit evidence that we've got, and that's what you have in the report in front of you. That report's very clear that some things have been achieved well, including establishing the overall framework for taxes, the bills that have been passed, um, the progress that's being made on other areas. But equally, at the time we concluded the audit work and I made my audit judgments, I felt there was a risk that um, both the staffing and the IT may not be fully in place at the end of March. Um, we hear as you have done, that there's a significant amount of work going on to make sure that everything is in place as required. Um, but without auditing that, I don't feel I can take my conclusions further than I have done at the moment. Mm -hmm. We all want this to work, and we very much recognise the amount of um, commitment and investment that both Scottish Government and Revenue Scotland are making towards that. Um, but I need to reserve my position until I've got audit evidence to work with, I think. But at the time, if we're talking in terms of the point where it was written, um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not having a go at you over that, uh, obviously. Um, the, uh, at the point it was written, there were concerns. I think that a lot of us are feeling a bit happier simply because of what's been heard um, after that. Uh, but it is, to me, the first thing in the Exhibit 3 that was uh, really enlightening was the decision relatively quickly to actually say this is either beyond us for whatever reason and to move it to an external source which I, you know, I, I think um, is commendable and it's good that it's been highlighted there. As we've said, that looks to us like a sound decision. Um, we also say in the report that Revenue Scotland does now have detailed plans in place. I think our, our finding alongside that is that um, had the scale of the programme been uh, recognised and staffed for earlier, some of those delays may not have happened. Um, but in terms of the response being made at this stage, it's clear there's a significant commitment and investment being made. OK, well, since we're pressed for time, I'll leave it there okay. just now. Uh, Tavish Scott and then Colin Beatty. Convener, um, can I just deal with the dates because they really matter in this particular report? Um, Auditor General, you said the uh, Audit Scotland report was completed in early no November. Can you give us a date on that, when the I'll actual date? I'll ask Mark to talk you through the, the final stages. This was fast moving all the way through, as you can imagine. Mark. Yeah. I, I think it's uh, uh, worth saying to, to, to start off with that, that because of the nature of the fast moving environment, we uh, did everything we could to try and get an understanding of the position up to when we needed to go to press effectively. Yeah. Uh, I think the effective date for that was in terms of field work, when we were gathering evidence and looking at that evidence, I think at the end of October was where we uh, had final uh, pieces of evidence that were put, put in front of us. We then had a bit of reflection of that and a bit of discussion about one of, what, uh, what some of that meant, and that's where we came up with the date of, of early October. So in terms of our field work, end of, end of, end of, sorry, end of early November, in terms of our field work, bits of evidence up to the end of October, and then some further discussion in the early days of November. And then, when was the uh, when was the final report um, cleared by the government and by Revenue Scotland in terms of factual accuracy? Date what date was that cleared on? Because they must have emails which say yeah. exactly when that's cleared. I think I think uh, broadly, and then we can get back to you on the specifics. So broadly, that would be about a week into November, in a broad sense, in the first half of November. But I think rather than me trying to have a stab, if colleagues don't know at the exact date, if we come back to you on the specific first half date, of November. yeah. Yeah, OK. And then it took from the, the middle of November to, to the 11th of, of uh, December before publication. In that period, nothing happened. It was just the report was being sent to the printers and all the rest of it. Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, Gordon Jen, you said in your opening remarks that staff were not in place early enough. Did you discover why not? Um, I think... Um 
that the, the team will want to add to what I'm about to say. I think there's two dimensions to that. In paragraph 14, I make the comment that um, Revenue Scotland di didn't early enough have in place the staff needed to manage a programme of this scale and complexity. Um, and I think the staffing required in the uh, tax administration programme element of thinking through the whole way in which this would work um, was uh, slower in coming together than, with hindsight, um, was needed. Um, beyond that, uh, I think there is the evidence that we've seen coming through uh, both in the findings we make about why costs have risen and in the evidence given to the Finance Committee about the growing understanding of what's involved in putting together a new tax administration authority of this scale for the first time where it hasn't been in place before. So I think there's, there's an element of underestimating the scale of it early on and then an unavoidable element of simply learning from experience as the process goes on. They, did the government bring in expertise? external expertise from people who actually have run tax systems from other parts of the UK or anywhere else in the world? I think there has been close working through the Tax Administration Programme Board um, with a range of people around Scotland and further afield. I'll ask Mark and Gordon to talk you through how that's worked in detail to avoid... Yes. If they brought in expertise from other parts of, or from wherever else to help them do this work. If I could perhaps, perhaps answer that. I think it's important to distinguish between putting the project team together... And, and putting operational team in place. I think the project team is very much, of course, focused on the project of getting the IT systems and the organisation established, and that the operational team then, then administers taxes. In terms of the operational team, uh, the, the approach the Scottish Government has taken is to, be, to identify its own staff, but to look to draw on the pool of expertise to bring those staff into place, and to uh, prioritise those sort of posts, those technical posts. And at the time of writing the report, you'll see that we recognised the progress that we've made. I think there was 10 positions that were filled at that point. In terms of the project team... To that. So what was that expertise that you found? What expertise did they bring in that you found? Um, the, it's probably worth noting that the, the, the tax administration programme board, which, are, which is overseeing the project to implement the devolved taxes, that has representation from HMRC, yeah. um, who sit on the board. Um, so there was expertise coming in through those, those government, governance yeah. arrangements, yes. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have details to hand on the um, staff who are employed as part of the, the programme team and what their background is, but our understanding is that some of those staff do have a background in, in tax administration. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, you can do a bit more than our, our understanding is. I mean, I'm not, I don't mean to be pushy or anything, but it's just really important to understand whether this, this expertise was brought in or whether they were just uh, civil servants moved from a completely different department, you know, running ag or something, suddenly told to set up a tax system. Is that not what... I mean, trying to discover you didn't find that. It was rather better than that, is what I'm driving at. But I'd quite like to know for sure that wasn't the case. I think, I think we were content in terms of the oversight of the project and the arrangements, yeah. as Rebecca's talked about, that, yeah. that the right people were involved in that. And there was that. an understanding of what, what, yeah. what the, the job was, mm -hmm. I think, to answer yes. that question. Yeah. Okay, right, okay. I think I'm reassured by that. Um, you uh, uh, also said, Auditor General, that, and you've uh, touched on this at some length already this morning, that the IT system is, may not be op fully operational by a go date in, in April, and your, your Exhibit 3 shows we're running two, week, two, sorry, two months behind schedule, according to the time plan. I mean, I guess that's the cause of your concern about the risk. <laughs> It is. Um, as you say, the decision to, to purchase rather than to develop the system um, was taken later and then the procurement itself took longer. The system is now in place, is being developed and tested. But as I say in paragraph 32 of the report, it, those delays reduce the time that's available to implement the full IT system and make sure that all of the piece, pieces act together, that it's compatible with the government's accounting system so that the money can be transferred into the government's account smoothly to do to user development and training and testing, um, and then to make sure that all of the various bits of the process work together as planned. Yeah. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that there isn't time for that to happen. I'm saying the time for it to happen has Absolutely. been reduced and that, that assurance isn't yet in place. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. fine. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, uh, Colin Beattie and then Sandra White. Thank you, Peter. General, uh, I share some of the confusion that's been expressed in terms of this report. Um, Overall, the report seems to indicate a well-managed project that uh, overall is uh, progressing well. Um, 
two areas have been highlighted in terms of uh, human resources and, uh, and IT. When you were carrying out the audit, did you look at the robustness of the contingency plans behind it? When we were carrying out the audit work, the contingency plans were still being developed, so it wasn't possible to look at them in detail. We do know that they focus on um, making sure that the taxes can be collected come the 1st of April, but that there may be more paperwork, more manual processing required to do that um, than, would, uh, than was originally planned. But at the time we completed the audit work, those contingency plans weren't developed enough to be audited. Looking at, looking at the IT system, there's a couple of things that sort of jump out. Uh, on paragraph 36 on page 15, uh, comments made that uh, about the government's accounting system to record and account for the devolved taxes. And you see here, currently this work has not been affected by the delays in developing the central tax collection IT system. Now, I'm just a layman, but that looks to me as if the core system there for recording the taxation and so forth is already there, so they can record and account for it. So that's, that, is, that is in place. The um, core C system is there and has been for a, a number of years now. It's a long-standing and stable system. The, the challenge is to make sure that the IT system that will be processing the payments, particularly for the land and building transaction tax, can talk smoothly to the um, C system, the financial system, and that the appropriate controls are in place, given the importance of those transactions. One piece of the IT system, actually, that, is, that uh, looks like it may be running behind. No, that's, that's, the, that's the interface with C's, which has not yet, yet been tested. The whole system, um, the implementation of the whole system for administering the taxes is the system where the decision was taken late, the procurement was late, and the testing is still underway to make sure it can do what's required come the 1st of April. Now, clearly you've highlighted the decision to move to a, a central IT system, and you have uh, said that you, you agreed with that decision. In terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the wisdom of doing so, what sort of delay did that actually contribute? I mean, I think I think you're probably talking about seven or eight weeks delay in total to the IT system. What proportion of that was caused by the decision to to move to a different outcome? We've tried to lay it out as clearly as we can in Exhibit Three. Gordon, do you want to talk, Mr? Beatty through the um, timeline in a bit more detail. Yeah, if it would help. So in January, I think it's quite a substantial and important decision there at that point that the Revenue Scotland would take on more of the responsibility than originally we planned. I think we see in the report as well, important to realise that at that point and at that point in the decision, that account was taken of preliminary work that both happened in uh, SEPA and Register of Scotland. So that was that point. Um, through, through there to um, April, was when the uh, IT uh, supplier to be, to, to be identified. And I think that it's over that period, if, um, if this is about the amount of time the government now has to deliver this system, Revenue Scotland, to put the system in place, round about this time, probably the, with hindsight, more could have been done over that period. The, what was happening within the Scottish Government was they were looking at the options for how that system might be delivered. That then tied in with the conversation we've had earlier this morning about the decision that they would externalise that rather than use in-house provision. And there were good reasons why they didn't decide to go down the in-house route. Having decided to go down that road, they then put in place, as we see in this Exhibit 3, the process that they would go around actually seeking an external supplier. Um, if you're asking where the delays were, I think there was a delay between the decision in January to go ahead with the uh, with, a, with a revised system involving more work for, for Revenue Scotland and the decision ultimately to get an external supplier in. So that was over quite a few periods of uh, quite a few months. So you're saying really between January and April when they were identifying a supplier, an external supplier? Well, I think the, right the decision was being made there about how that was actually going to be implemented. As we see in this exhibit here, the option to develop the system, uh, the in-house system, was rejected at the end of April. So there was okay. that period between January and April when there were discussions ongoing about how best to deliver. So it took three months to, to, de to decide which way to go? That's my understanding. That's what our report says. 
Does that seem unreasonable? Um, it's difficult to know. We can only go on the basis of the evidence that we've got available. Presumably there were discussions ongoing. We've certainly seen through uh, the paperwork, that, and, and that's the evidence base we have of this, of the various boards and, 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 and teams within uh, Scottish Government Revenue Scotland looking at the options over that period. Um, uh, big decisions to be made, and uh, I think, I think you'd have to speak to the panel after us yeah. about what was actually happening in that period. I have to say to a layman, it doesn't seem who has been involved in IT systems, taking a decision over three months on that doesn't seem too out of order. On page 12, paragraph 23, we're talking about uh, jobs. And we're talking about 40 posts in total. Now, you say phase two, which is 20 posts, was on schedule, as per the original estimate. Is that correct? For phase two, we're saying that the confirmation of job descriptions and grades happened a little later than planned. Um, originally, September was completed in mid-October, um, and the staff were due to be imposed by February of next year, and clearly we don't know whether they will be imposed by that date or not. But there was no reason to think they wouldn't be at that point, Other otherwise you wouldn't have said as originally estimated. Which is the estimate, yes. but as I say, we're working with the audit evidence yes. that's available to us at that point. We haven't drawn a conclusion about it other than to note that the confirmation of job descriptions was a bit later than originally planned. Yeah, but there was no indications at that point that these 20 posts were necessarily going to be outside the estimate given. No indication that they would be outside, but also no confirmation that they'd be inside, given the, the concerns there, be, there can be in recruiting two specialist posts of this nature. I think all I can do, Mr Beattie, is, yeah. is refer you to the evidence we've used in the report. So it sounds a bit like damned if you do, damned if you don't. No, I think one of, the, one of the values we can provide to the Parliament is providing assurance about the process of these big and complex programmes and highlighting where the risks remain. That, that's a remaining risk which needs to be managed. That's all we're saying. I mean, Clearly on the staffing side, the First Minister uh, last Thursday there gave uh, a clear response on the, on the posts and where recruitment was on it, and there seems to be every reassurance that that's going to be on schedule. So when are you going to be looking at all this again? We keep it under review routinely as part of our audit of Scottish Government, and um, we'll keep in touch with... Uh, colleagues in Government and Revenue Scotland responsible for it. Um, we're not planning to keep going in and um, checking the progress they're making when we all hope the progress, um, the focus will be on getting the IT system up and running and people in place. Um, we're reassured by the commitment that's evident to uh, uh, taking the plans that are now in place and delivering them effectively for the 1st of April. Um, and what we're doing at this stage is providing evidence to the Parliament about the progress that's been made. Again, just a small point. On page uh, 16, paragraph 41, you refer to, given Revenue Scotland's difficulties in recruiting to their operational team, which is slightly different from saying that they were delayed in recruiting. You're saying they've got difficulties recruiting. Where does that come from? I'll ask Gordon and Mark to talk you through the background to that, given the sensitivity of it. Gordon, Mark? Sorry, yeah. Um, I, th I think what we're trying to say there, uh, Mr Beattie, is looking at the track record that we've had so far. Uh, so there were delays in coming to decision about the, the, the actual number of staff. So I, think, I think there are good reasons for that. I don't want to understate that. I think uh, there is an important thing, job to do, to understand with the gift of, if you like, a better understanding of what's needed in terms of staffing that a decision is made. All we're seeing in the report is based on the evidence that we've got available to us that the, um, some of these timescales have slipped. And I think we said a few times this morning our concern, the risks that we flag are to do with the period of time between when these important decisions are made and then when actions are taken and the time at which the taxes are due to start and be collected from the 1st of April. So that, 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 that's why, where we're coming from there. But what we're saying in terms of your specific point about uh, difficulties, I think it's about the extent to which staff have actually been brought through the door in accordance with these revived time t revised time, t time scales. And I think it's reasonable for us in a report which reflects on the risks that are available, a that, a risk that we see at that point of time that we, we use language like this in the report. Again, on page 25, paragraph 69, there's reference to work between yourself and NAO. Now, you're talking about here reporting annually in this assurance work, 
there's no indication given here of cost. Um, the, uh, In other words, your cost on yeah. top of NEO. Yes, um, we've we've given evidence to the committee on this um, previously, and the real challenge with the Scottish rate of income tax and potentially with further devolved taxes under the Smith Commission is that those taxes will continue to be collected by HMRC um, and assigned to the Scottish Parliament. Now, HMRC is a UK-wide body which under statute is audited by the NAO and will continue to be so. There's no question about that. Um, they uh, already do that very effectively and report to the UK Parliament about it. Now, the Scottish taxes that are collected on behalf of the Scottish Parliament by HMRC will only be a small part of the audit responsibilities of NAO because they're a relatively small amount of the overall tax that HMRC collects. So we are working on the basis that in order to give this Parliament the assurance it needs about the taxes collected and the resource available to the Parliament for its own purposes, we will carry out some work to review the work that's planned by the NAO, to review the findings of that work, and then to report to this Parliament if we think it's appropriate to highlight any issues that are significant in the context of the Scottish budget, but insignificant in the context of HMRC's tax collection overall. At this stage, we're not expecting that to have significant additional costs, um, but we have flagged previously in our budget submissions um, that at this stage we're making no provision for new responsibilities that we may take on as a result of either the Scottish rate of income tax or, more significantly, the proposals that are coming out of the Smith Commission. As those develop, we may well need to do that, as other public bodies will as well. I suppose the only good news to, to note on costs is that the overall cost of implementing the SRIT is coming in below budget, 35 yes. to 40 million instead of 40 to 45 million. Absolutely, so. and we recognise in the report that the Scottish Government is working very closely with HMRC to bring that about. Okay. Now, Sandra, could you bear with me, uh, bring Nigel Don in and, and then yourself? Thank you very much, Convener, and good morning, Auditor General. And uh, thank, thank you, Convener. I, I do have to go in about five minutes to another committee on a constituency issue. A couple of quick points, if I may pick up. First of all, could I, could I pick up with the issue of risk? Because I understand from running a few small projects in my time that there's a risk, and there always is a risk. Uh, and therefore, can I just reflect with you, Auditor General, that it, whether or not the risk is 50-50 that something will go wrong or half of 1%, that something will go wrong, you would still describe that as a risk. And there's a very great, there, there is a, a risk in the other sense that the rest of the world will believe that the world is, is about to fall down, and, but, but actually the risk is minute. But you'd still describe it as a risk. You're absolutely right. Any project of this scale would bring risks with it, and we try hard to recognise that in the report. Um, what we're saying in this report, and after careful consideration, is that because of the delays that have been experienced against the Scottish Government's own plans, that risk is increased from where it previously would have been. That's not to say it can't be recovered. We are very aware of the scale of effort that's going on to, to make sure that the arrangements are in place as they need to be on the 1st of April, but the risk is increased from the uh, state of play earlier in the process because of the delays that have been experienced. Thank you. Could I then try and put that in the context of what I would describe from previous experience as the critical path, which I'm sure is a familiar term to you. Um, I'm, I'm looking again at, at page 14 and exhibit 3, but I'm thinking that if the Scottish Government's plans had put everything two months later, actually you would have had nothing to say other than that it was on plan. No, I'm not suggesting that they should have put things two months later, but I am reflecting that if they could still have got to the end point, in other words, the critical path would have allowed those points to be two months later, we would not be here talking about this because actually it would appear that everything was on target. So my question then becomes, Auditor General, where is the critical path in all, path in all this, please? Uh, are, are those milestones now in the right place, or are we actually past them? It, it's a very good question, and we've tried to answer it in the way we've worded the report, which has taken a good deal of care, as you can imagine. We say that um, we think that the, uh, the detailed plans which are now in place could have been developed earlier, and had they been developed earlier, then there would have been a lower risk of these milestones being missed. That's not to say they wouldn't have been, or indeed that the plans may not have recognised that the critical path came later. I think the central point is that that detail planning didn't happen early enough, and therefore we are now in a position where the investment that's needed to hit the end point, and it is a fixed and important end point on the 1st of April, is more significant than it otherwise might have been. Thank you. 
I'm grateful. Sorry, okay. Yeah, thanks. Thank Sandra you. Wait. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. I just, I think you have said, you have said yourself, uh, Auditor General and uh, the convener also, in regarding it's a very large and complex issue and we shouldn't uh, pretend otherwise. It's also a very moving feast with the Smith Commission and Mr Taylor has already mentioned that with extra taxes coming in. In your opening statement, you said that you were auditing this while implementation was still taking place. Is that a normal process for Audit Scotland while implementation and changes? Obviously, the Smith Commission was just coming forward. And how difficult is that to audit when it is a moving feast? Things are changing all the time and new legislation is coming forward. It actually is something we do very, very frequently. Um, my strong view is that for large and complex projects or programmes like this, it's entirely appropriate for us to use our powers to provide assurance to the Parliament about progress rather than waiting for the end point and then reporting on what went wrong, if that's the case. It clearly doesn't always happen that way. Um, we've reported over the last few years on things like the Commonwealth Games at key points in their development, on major transport infrastructure like the second, fourth crossing, um, a number of other things which are large projects, um, lots of money involved and significant implications for public services. Um, and I, I hold to the belief that that's an important part of our role on behalf of Parliament. You're right, though, it does bring additional challenges with it, um, not least because... Um, the fact that we're auditing, it tends to change things. People recognise that we're doing the work we are. Um, very often we will either highlight things that hadn't been noticed or provide extra impetus to people to say we need more resource to get this delivered on time. Um, we work very hard to mitigate those, those risks and to maintain good engagement with the people that we're auditing. It, it is more challenging, and I still feel it's an important part of our role on behalf of Parliament. The point, the point I was trying to get at is just how accurate is it? You mentioned the Commonwealth mm -hmm. Games there. Now, they actually came in very much below budget. We actually saved money on that particular one. So the point I'm trying to make is how accurate is this you know, auditing while it's an ongoing feast when we have the evidence from the Commonwealth Games that we actually did save money and things worked absolutely fantastically during the Commonwealth Games. I think that's a great example of how this auditing can work. The, the prior reports we did on the Commonwealth Games um, both highlighted that progress was in line with the milestones and highlighted a couple of areas, particularly security, where um, there may be a need for more investment to deliver what was required. We're publishing a final report um, early in 2015 which will show exactly that. Um, but while, while I wouldn't say we always are able to forecast the future with absolute 2020 vision, nobody can, we can, we've got a pretty good track record of saying this is what's um, happening entirely satisfactorily, this is what's a real problem and here's where the risks lie. And we've tried to do that in a balanced way in this report. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. I think that it, it doesn't necessarily prove my point, but it does say that it's very difficult to be accurate in what a report. So whilst you have the report and you mentioned the fact, final accuracy of the report, which we have before us, you also mentioned the conclusions I draw from them. Now, it was raised by various members, if you know the parties involved, government, etc., had saw the final report and had raised any issues. But that's the final report and the accuracy. The conclusions which yourself has drawn from them is an entirely different issue. And that's very much why I've phrased my findings in the report and in discussion with the Commission today about the fact that I think there is an increased risk because of the delays that have been experienced in staffing and IT systems, not in any sense as a, a red flag or a warning that they won't be in place. I'm reporting to you my professional judgment based on the evidence that my colleagues have collected and analysed that that risk is greater and also acknowledge the significant work that's going on to overcome those delays and get to where we all want to be on the 1st of April next year. Yeah, I absolutely take on board absolutely uh, what you say, but to go back again, you cannot see into the future. And through the report, there are many aspects where you say it may, may happen, not definitely happen. So whilst I do welcome the report, and I think it's right that you should be highlighting issues which you draw from your conclusions, but are not necessarily in the final report as, as we have here. The point I'm trying to make is you mentioned the fact in here about the IT system. I think Mr Taylor said uh, you can say yes or no. That probably is the right way to go forward in the long term. 
to save money and obviously more transparency for not just the Parliament but the, the people of Scotland as well. I, I just want to be really clear that there are some areas here where what we're able to conclude is, for example, there is an increased risk and that there may be um, implications for cost and performance, but equally there are a number of points in the report and significant ones where we find there have already been delays that, that have led to that increased risk. So it, it's not a speculative report, it's drawing conclusions on the basis of the evidence available to us, which has been agreed for factual accuracy with colleagues in government and Revenue Scotland. Yeah factual accuracy but not your conclusions from it which obviously we see seems the government they haven't agreed uh, to the conclusions or well, perhaps they will when we get we ask them for evidence but I must bring you back to the mention what you said maybe I think we've got to keep that in mind maybe did you, you said it earlier I, it's also in the report yeah. as well I'm very happy to confirm that what, what I've concluded here is that there is an increased risk, which is clearly a, a future-looking um, dimension, but my conclusion is based on the delays which have happened in the past. So there's, there's an important balance to strike there, I think, between the evidence which, which we're working with and the conclusions that I've drawn. I don't think we're disagreeing. I think it's the balance between the two that's important. That's fine, Karina. Thank you. Three short questions before I invite the next panel of candidates. Is it possible in public sector contracts to show that you come in under budget by overstating the original estimate? I think it's possible in, in any contract to do that. Um, I don't want to speculate about any particular circumstances yeah. you may be referring to, convener. OK. Um, have you been notified of any intention to use contingency? At, at this stage, we understand that the contingency plans are being developed, but that Revenue Scotland and Scottish Government hope to um, make enough progress between now and the end of the year for those not to be required. Yeah. And the third question, um, it's a strange um, comment. Uh, what is it? Para page 16, paragraph 41. I just wonder if you could give some clarification. Um, the Scottish Government's current assessment is that while it currently has enough skilled people in place to fulfil its responsibilities, it is dependent on a single member of staff. Does that mean that you know, the absence of one person could have brought the project crashing? This is in relation to the development of the Scottish rate of income tax for April 2016, rather than the two new devolved taxes from 1st April 2015. Gordon, do you want to um, amplify the comment that we make there? I, I think it's just an observation that we had. This, this is obviously a, a, a longer term uh, point and an important point as well. And I think it is linked to this issue about just having the necessary capacity for the delivery. So we, I think... This, this part of the report is certainly a, a, a longer-term view, but we're, we're very much focusing on the devolved no, tax. No, no, I understand that. Immediate. But does that mean that the plans for the Scottish rate of income tax are, are actually dependent on one person? Not quite. I think Mark can give you a bit more detail on the, the uh, background to that. So I think the two points we make, one is that based on the workload there's been at the moment, that, that that's the right sort of capacity to deal with that workload. <coughs> the two points that we make in the report are that the workload is bound to grow in the future and that needs to be kept under review okay. and also that there's a resilience question that it, the dependence on that one person who has those skills, uh, the, the organisation needs to understand if that person is not around how they backfill for that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Certainly, Gil. I yeah. was intending not to say anything but you raise a question from a business perspective and the answer you gave, Auditor General, that there is a, a possibility that folk would over-tender and it would be agreed by the government. No, that, I'm sorry, if that's the impression that I gave, that wasn't what I intended no, at I all. No, I think the question was, is it possible to overestimate a ten, overestimate I, I, The way I interpreted it was that, no. it, that it would be possible to um, set a budget which had... Um, no, I wasn't talking about the tenning no, process. Is that not related to generous. the tenning process? That, that no. in effect, would be happening? No, no, no. What, what, can, what, can I ask the question? Well, well, if I could just clarify, because, you know, maybe I, I hope I didn't mislead the Auditor General. The question no, I was asking me. is in indicating potential costs for projects, is it possible to show that projects come in under budget by overstating what the potential cost is? So it's clearly, I'm not talking, no. Auditor General, about the tendering process. And that, that's how I interpreted the question. Can yeah. the, the, and then can I come back sure, in? From, again, from a business perspective, is that possible to happen, happen because of the tender process that's involved? 
If the tender process works properly, then then no, the tender process should be the competition so, which brings um, so in other words, a, a true. When it comes cost to public it. sector contracts, what actually happens is there is a tender made, and because of the efficiency of the work carried out, that's where you get the, the cost savings. In this, we're, this is clearly a theoretical discussion, um, well, and not, in, not for me, not in a business. I, I, no, I, I, I do it all the time, I, I, and I understand that entirely, Mr. Yeah. Paston. But I can't, I can't, um, I can't. What I'm trying to avoid is the implication that I'm talking about any particular project or contract. Right, okay. There's clearly the scope between setting a budget for a big project or a big programme and the um, the cost, the final cost coming in, room for an awful lot of movement. That if if there is true competition for a contract as part of that budget, then that ought to be driving out any overstatement in in that part of the budget. I understand that. Um, and there may be many other things that happen between the initial budget and the final estimate that would also have an impact. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Mr. General, can I thank you and your team for thank your you, contribution? Well, I'll briefly suspend, but it will only be a short suspension until we get the next panel of witnesses in, because um, they do need to be away. If, uh, if I can reconvene the meeting and uh, welcome our next panel of candidates, um, Eleanor, uh, sorry, with Alison Stafford, the Director General Finance of the Scottish Government, Eleanor Emberson, the Head of Revenue Scotland, um, John King, Business Development Director, Registers of Scotland, and John Kenny, Head of Operations at SEPA. Um, I believe that, Alison, you would like to make an opening statement. That's right, yes, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Convener and members of the committee. Uh, we are pleased to be here to help the committee with its examination of the considerable work done and in train to implement the Scotland Act 2012. Revenue Scotland, obviously established by the Revenue Scotland and Tax Power Act, has an important part to play in the Im implementation of the 2012 Act. In January 2015, it will become a separate body within the Scottish Administration, and like bodies such as the Scottish Court Service and Registers of Scotland, Revenue Scotland will be operationally independent of Scottish Ministers and will be directly accountable to the Scottish Parliament. Revenue Scotland will be ready to administer the assessment and collection of the devolved taxes from April 2015 and the subsequent compliance regime. The effective collection of devolved taxes in Scotland relies on the right conditions to be created. So these conditions include a principle-based approach to taxation, where the spirit as well as the letter of the law must be upheld by taxpayers and their agents, 
and the Cabinet Secretary set out in June 2012 his approach based upon Adam Smith's four, prax four maxims. These have underpinned all the work to establish the devolved taxes in Scotland. A further condition is obviously the programme of robust legislation, which commands a high degree of consensus. So, for example, the Revenue Scotland and Tax Power Act received unanimous approval at each stage by the Finance Committee and by the whole of Parliament. The conditions also include active engagement with the appropriate stakeholder communities. In the case of the two devolved taxes, agents of land and buildings transaction taxpayers, landfill site operators and a range of professional bodies, these people continue to participate to inform policy formulation and to guide operational implementation. So this means operational processes will be user-friendly to those who need to use them. And at the heart of this activity in Scotland is the Tax Consultation Forum and the Devolved Tax Collaborative. Unique to the Scottish approach, accessible, broad-based, issue-specific working groups. And good governance of the processes that administer tax is the final key condition. The Tax Administration Programme and Revenue Scotland have been established to deliver these and will. So what we are now seeing is the final stages of a journey that began in June 2012, when the Cabinet Secretary announced his decision in Parliament to establish a tax authority for Scotland. And to use the words of the Auditor General, there are now well-developed project plans for implementing the devolved taxes. So using these plans, Revenue Scotland has provided online tax calculators so people can work out the tax due based on the proposed rates and bans. It's launched its website, has developed a core IT system to process tax returns and the associated case management, currently subject to internal testing. It has finalised payment systems and banking arrangements. It's currently consulting with users on the drafting of technical guidance for taxpayers both for both of the taxes and has a fully staffed programme team to continue its programme delivery and is recruiting staff for its operational delivery as and when they are needed. So there are positive actions being delivered thick and fast. My colleagues and I are well placed to help the committee with your exploration of the opportunities and risks and to set out the robust actions that are in place to manage and mitigate them. All of us and our teams are highly motivated and committed to deliver the effective collection and administration of taxation from the 1st of April next year. With me are Eleanor Emberson, Head of Revenue Scotland since October 2012. She is the Chair of the Tax Administration Programme Board and former Chief Executive of the Scottish Court Service. John King, the Business Development Director at Registers of Scotland and lead for ROS on the Tax Administration Programme Board. John has been with ROS for 30 years. John Kenny, Head of National Operations at SEPA and lead for SEPA on the Tax Administration Programme Board. John has been with SEPA since its inception 18 years ago. And as you know, I'm the Director General of Finance of the Scottish Government. I chair the Fiscal Responsibility Programme Board and obviously happy to cover the other aspects of the implementation of the Scotland Act that sit outside the scope of Revenue Scotland. OK, thank you very much for that, Alison. Um, two questions uh, to start. Um, very complicated finance systems being set up and one in which uh, we all depend uh, being done effectively and efficiently. Um, in terms of, you, you've highlighted the range of experience of, of the people involved, but particularly uh, for Scottish Government and Revenue Scotland, which would be uh, yourself and Eleanor, um, can you tell me what, uh, what accounting qualifications you have and what revenue experience you have? So I am uh, qualified as a chartered accountant and also um, recognised as a SIPFA accountant, so private and public sector. So my qualification includes taxation. Um, so that covers that particular span of your question. Okay, I'll and Eleanor? To respond. Um, so I have... Uh, I, I 
don't have an accounting qualification. I have undertaken two uh, of the exams within the ICAS tax professional qualification that they have introduced. I passed both of those. Um, I have gone out of my way, however, to hire uh, people from HMRC who have expertise in tax, and I obviously have considerable expertise in running programmes and in running a public body. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I don't know if it's Alison or, or Eleanor um, that should answer this, but uh, paragraph 30, um, the delays in the IT system, um, the option to develop the IT system fully within the Scottish Government um, were explored. It says This was rejected at the end of April 2014 as the Scottish Government did not have the staff or expertise available to develop the system within the timescales due to other commitments. Um, were the other, did the other commitments include preparations for the referendum? Um, I'm afraid I didn't explore the range of other commitments that the Scottish Government I team, IT team were facing, um, but they included things like the Commonwealth Games and the Ryder Cup, and as has already been noted by the Auditor General, at least one other very major IT project already underway. Um, the, the point when we took that decision was it was about actually taking the lowest risk option. Yeah. The, the development. Who would, able, who would be able to tell me what the other commitments were that the staff were involved in? Um, well, I presume colleagues who deal, who, who line manage the IT team. And who would, which department would that rest within? Would it be Scottish Government or Revenue Scotland? Or, you know, who? Oh, so within Scottish Government, yes. yes. So would it be yourself, Alison? Well, the Director of Digital would be the best person. Right, so perhaps you could maybe find out for me um, what other commitments they were, they were engaged in and whether that included the referendum. Yes, we can come back to the committee on okay, that. Okay, thank you. Um, Eleanor, you indicated um, on the 26th of November that to the Parliament, the uh, Committee of the Parliament, there is nothing negative that I need to report. And yet we have a number of warnings from Audit Scotland um, repeated in their press release issued on the 11th of December 2014 that the delays have increased the risk that the IT system not, may not be fully functioning by the 1st of April 2015 and that Revenue Scotland won't have the required operational expertise in place by then. Do you not think that's uh, a negative? Well, two things about that. Um, I reported fully to the Finance Committee that we, were, we had a number of areas that were at amber that we were managing back to green. And that's, that's a reflection of managing risk, because that's what you do in project management. My specific words about nothing negative were in response to a question from Gavin Brown, who noted that my written report to the Finance Committee had gone in in, in mid-October, as, as had been agreed. And because of other committee business, they, they were not seeing me until the end of November. So um, he noted that, as he put it, there's been a slight time gap could I tell him if anything material had changed between my written report in mid-October and my appearance at the end of November? And I responded, there has been a lot of progress, but there is nothing negative that I need to report. You said that we are still on track in, on all areas. Confident. And the Audit Scotland press release indicates that the, the IT system may not be fully functioning by the 1st of April. So which is right? Audit Scotland or your comment that we are still on track in all areas? Well, we are on track on all areas. Um, so the Audit Scotland report is wrong? I'm not saying that. The oh, sorry, it's either right or wrong. Yeah. So if you're not saying that it's wrong, you're, say, or you're not saying it's right, you're saying it's wrong? It is managing programmes and managing projects is about managing risk. We are on track because we are managing the risks that, that Audit Scotland have highlighted. Increased risk. Yes. So th there is no contradiction in those two statements. There's not. So we can see that you're on target, but that the system may not be fully functioning by the 1st of April 2015. Why is there no contradiction in that? Um, the, the Auditor General has just highlighted that there is a risk but as has been discussed in front of the committee, there are always risks. We manage risks. We are confident we have managed this one. 
Life has moved on a long way since the Auditor General's staff did their field work. I, we have an IT system currently in testing. I've seen it. It's being tested internally at the moment. We will bring in external users to test it in January. That's how I can be confident we're on track. Okay. So did you challenge the statement that the IT system may not be fully functioning by the 1st of April 2015 when you were given the draft report? I, I challenged a number of statements in Did the Did you challenge report. that one? I, I challenged the perception of risk. I mean, the Did you tell Audit Scotland that that was wrong because you're still in track? Um, Audit Scotland's response to me when I discussed all this with them was that they still saw a risk and they felt they had to highlight the risk. The fact that I am managing the risk wasn't... We, I see it that we are on track. They note that there is a risk. I think I'm managing it. They have to draw their own conclusions from the evidence in front of them. The report also says there's a risk that Revenue Scotland will not fill all of its operational posts in line with its plans. Was that wrong as well? Um, again, I think the risk that Audit Scotland perceived has reduced dramatically. Um, the First Minister gave an update in the Chamber last week, but even since then, life has moved on. Audit Scotland was noting that we had re recruited 10 of the operational staff. As of today, it's 21. And I have eight more in the process of recruitment, three of them with interviews scheduled, and five more just not quite at that stage yet. So will uh, you fill all your operational posts in line with your plans? We will have everything, all the operational staff we need in time for April, yes. Okay. Um, were ministers alerted to the warning that not enough staff were in place? Um, the programme staff. Well, any staff. Uh, the, so it's important to distinguish in the report between the programme staff who've worked on setup and the operational staff who will um, who will manage live running. Okay. Well, tell me about both then. So in the programme staffing, um, Audit Scotland have indicated that that they say they have concluded that the staff that they consider were required were not in place. I don't accept the word required. I, if, if it were possible to have the time over again, I would seek to have more of the set-up staff in earlier, but I don't believe that it was necessary. I don't think it would have materially changed where we are right now. Um, so why would you have done it different if it wasn't necessary? It would have been helpful. As the Auditor General has pointed out, um, you, as, you, as you work through a programme like this, you, you iterate planning. So when you start, you have a very high-level plan. And particularly in a programme like this, when you're working alongside legislation, you match the level of detail of the programme planning to the development of the policy and the legislation. So you can't have completely detailed plans for implementation until you understand exactly what you're going to implement. So it would have been... Um, unhelpful to have 40 staff in place two years ago. Um, I think we have the right level of staffing in now. Um, I think if we, if I could have, if I could go back and do it again, I might have built the team up about two months faster or so than I actually did, with benefit of hindsight. Um, at various times posts weren't filled. Did ministers agree? that uh, there should be non-recruitment of staff at any time? Uh, I, I didn't go to ministers at any point over right. the recruitment of um, okay. set-up staff. Um, costs have risen by £2 million. £1.7 Well, nearly £2 million, OK. Um, is this the end of the rise? Is that the final figure? I believe so. Right, so you, you will be able to report that uh, that's the end of it? That's, those are my current best estimates. Right. Okay. Uh, Colin Beatty. You know, just, just to be absolutely clear, you're telling us that as far as IT systems are concerned, are now on track and that staff recruitment is on track. Absolutely. And that as of the 1st of April, we're not going to have any surprises. Well, I'm not in control of whether there will be any surprises, but I am confident that we will have a full IT system and, a, and, a, and the operational staff required to run the organisation. Okay. Now, there were three recommendations for Revenue Scotland in the summary to the report and one for the Scottish Government. Have these recommendations been implemented? Um, they, they are indeed. They're all things that we were doing anyway, but we 
we recognise them as things that need to be done and we are doing them. Contingency planning. Yes. Now, Audit Scotland uh, were of the opinion that, that back in October contingency plans were being developed. Are they now in place to cover key eventualities? Yes, we have, we have a, a full contingency plan now. Um, we're finalising the last details of elements of it, but we have a full contingency plan now. So we have a backup if there's a problem with the IT system that's unforeseen? As you would expect me to have, yes. Yeah. In paragraph 41 of the report, reference is made to difficulties in recruiting operational staff. Have there, have there been any difficulties, or has it just been timing? Um, I, I think you need to understand on operational staff that we deliberately changed our plans around the recruitment. As we looked at it in more detail, we realised that we didn't need people as early as we had originally thought. Um, we haven't so far had any difficulties. Um, it would appear that people want to come and work for us. So you, are, you compared to the original schedule for taking staff on board, you modified that in the light of experience to it, yes. reflect the fact you didn't need the staff at that particular key point. Yes, and indeed to reflect value for money, as this committee would expect me to do. The decision to move to a central IT system Reference is made here of a, a four, in paragraph 30 of a four-month delay in making that decision, that was between January and April. It, is that an unusually long period in making that decision? Um, that, that was the period in which we were looking at the in-house option. Hmm. Um, we had to work it through in a lot of detail with our colleagues in Scottish Government IT. It's, it's not a decision that one takes on the basis of a casual conversation. There needs to be a very full understanding of requirements on both sides. Um, I, wouldn't, I, I don't think it was an unreasonable length of time to spend looking at that option. If Audit Scotland went in tomorrow and did this report again, do you think they would uh, come up with the same result? I'd be very surprised if they did. Um, they could, for instance, now have a demo of the IT system um, and they would be able to meet the operational staff. So it would, things would look materially different to the, the position in October when, when a lot of the field work is being done. Okay. okay. Uh, Tavish Scott. Oh, sorry, Mary Scanlon and then Colin Kerr and then Tavish Scott. Sorry, can, can I just ask a question? The contingency plan. Uh, if the IT system fails and the Auditor General has not just said it's a risk, but it's an increased risk in paragraph one, uh, could you confirm to me that the contingency p plan is manually written pen and paper of between 450 and 600 transactions, for example, at the Registers of Scotland every day? Uh, it's, uh, it would involve solicitors sending in manual um, uh, paper tax returns, which is an option we're going to offer them anyway, even when the IT system is live. So the contingency uh, plan is pen and paper? For solicitors to send in their returns, we, however, would, uh, would have a uh, way of processing those um, behind the scenes. <laughs> what? There are 450 to 600 transactions a day at Ross. There's something like 40 at SEPA. For everyone that... Uh, has a transaction, is the contingency plan pen and paper? The, the contingency plan for, is for everyone who would be submitting a land and buildings transaction tax return to submit paper. Yeah. Paper. OK, thank you. Can I just ask uh, Alison Stafford, uh, time, obviously we're, we're um, com uh, constrained by time this morning, but I have two papers here from your predecessor, uh, Paul Gray, who gave a categoric, categoric assurance to this committee in October 2012 that everything was totally on course for the land, buildings and transactions tax. I have it all written here. So what happened between October 2012 and October 2014 and the first week in November when the Auditor General and her staff collected the information about your progress and highlighted to this Parliament that there was an increased risk that Scotland would not be able to collect the taxes on the 1st of April. What happened? So, um, 
Ms. Scanlon, if I can just say, in terms of whether I've had a predecessor, I have actually been in this post as Director General since 2010 and been the Principal Financial Advisor to the Government since 2000. He responded to the Managing ICT contracts. I, and so, he was and, the person in charge at that time. Yes, and so the ICT um, digital leadership sits with other parts within the Government, so it, it actually isn't something that comes under my direct responsibility as Direct General for Finance. Um, so, but you were asking about, obviously, how this programme is going in terms of for Revenue Scotland. So, in terms of... What happened between the categoric assurance and the increased risk? The so categoric assurance of success and the increased risk, that's what I'm asking about. So, as Eleanor has already said, there are risks in any project and any programme. And the elements and the actions that are in place now are to manage those risks, to manage them actively between now and the end of April. Um, two years to manage the risk that was confidently on course for collection. And two years, two months later, Auditor General says there's an increased risk. You're categorically confident. You're ready to collect this tax on course two years, two months ago. So December 2014, you've got an increased risk. I'm asking what's happened in between. To be fair, I would need to check exactly the record of what Paul was saying at that point in time. Here, I'm happy to pass it on. OK. And, um, I need a back. I like to refer to it. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I understand about your pile of paper. Yep. So, um, but in terms of this particular programme of activity, there's obviously been a series of actions that have taken place. That's included having legislation in place. So a number of the actions in terms of legislation have been running um, during that time frame that you've been referring to. So the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax, Scottish Landfill Tax and the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill. So all of that legislation has taken place. Um, in terms legislation of the, led to the delay? No, it's not led to the delay. It's been an integral part of actually having the right conditions so that Revenue Scotland can specify an actual IT element within the whole programme of delivery to take place. That work on that specification was actually um, started over a year ago working with business analysts, and I know Eleanor can say more about this, to actually specify what's required, to have the discussions about whether that's appropriate to be an in-house or an externally supplied activity. The contract having been um, agreed from a supplier that's off a framework agreement where there is knowledge and experience of working with this supplier that have credibility and a track record with the Scottish Government, that supplier has actually then been delivering on time and on budget since that contract has been established. And that's why Eleanor is able to say that, yes, there are risks that have to be managed, but there is confidence in the actions that are being taken, the collaboration that's happening across Revenue Scotland, Register Scotland and SEPA, and with the suppliers and all the various experts that have been involved in this to actually um, enable that taxes can be collected from the 1st of April next year. As a member of this committee, I don't really like being given assurances, which I accept, and then being told of increased risks, but we will move on. The setting up of Revenue Scotland, uh, we will serve the needs of the people of Scotland at a lower cost than the UK, according to John Swinney, the Finance Secretary, and, I, you know, well done. So the original cost of setting up Reg Register Scotland, £22 million, and the Finance Secretary was bringing it in uh, at a lower price, 25% lower than the UK. It's now less than 5% lower. So uh, wh what's happened there? Why have the costs increased so much for the setting up of Revenue Scotland? Why did the Finance Secretary give a commitment, which I understand was discussed with... Uh, it would have been discussed with yourselves. He's given a commitment, 22 million, 25% less than UK. It's now less than 5%. What happened there? Um, there are two elements to that, uh, one of which was reported fully um, to Parliament with the financial memorandum of the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill. Um, so there are, if I can use language of project management, there are changes to scope and there are changes to estimates. So the changes to scope are the bits that were, that were reported fully in the financial memorandum of the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill a year ago. Um, 
where Revenue Scotland is, going, is now investing in developing one central IT system, and we're putting additional resources into compliance for both Revenue Scotland and for SEPA to make sure that we are able to use the legislation that Parliament has given us, which, for instance, um, includes taxing illegal dumping and wider compliance powers for Revenue Scotland. So those were deliberate changes um, to meet the, the requirements of the taxes now put in place by the Parliament. The remaining 1.7 million is changes in estimates um, where my original estimates of set-up costs um, have not turned out to be as accurate as I would have wished and our costs have gone up. Well, could I just ask, I appreciate that this must be very embarrassing for you and I appreciate it must be very embarrassing for the Finance Secretary who made a promise on the information he had, it would be 25% lower. Uh, now, given that we've heard there's an increased risk today that will not be ready for, to collect these taxes and we may be resorting to quill and ink and all sorts of things. So, have you ever considered going back to the Westminster government to ask if they would delay implementation of these taxes, given the huge problems you've had over years, uh, to ask if they would perhaps delay in order to help you get your house in order? We are absolutely on track. There's no need for any delay. OK, we've heard that before, but my final question. You mentioned the canons of taxation now, being an old economist. I do know about Adam Smith's canons of taxation. I think I'm right in saying the Registers of Scotland is a self-financing agency. Is that correct? Yes. Now, given that uh, I've lost count of the millions and millions of pounds that's been spent on IT, the last time you were here it was an increase from 67 to 113 million, but that was a couple of years ago. But one of uh, uh, Adam Smith's canons of taxation is that if it costs more to collect a tax than the revenue gained from that tax, then <laughs> that's a tax you don't collect. And the example was the dog licence. Um, so given that it's costing you so much to collect this tax, will you now have to increase the cost of stamp duty to homeowners across Scotland, given the difficulties that you've faced, given the assurances that we've had? And if I may say to Caroline Gardner, even her predecessor, Bob Black, brought concerns to us of the long history of IT problems in Ross. So given the problems you've had, given the huge increase in cost, will home buyers have, and uh, uh, businesses have to pay more in stamp duty in order that you continue to be self-financing? I mean, I'd pass that one over to, to Eleanor or Alison. We're, we're not building the, the collection system. That's Revenue Scotland. It's building the collection system. We have a role to play in supporting that. Um, it's a very limited role. Um, in terms of IT, uh, we have to deliver an authentication server. That's already there. Um, we've delivered that as part of um, delivery of four new IT systems, which we have introduced to support the, um, the Scottish Parliament's New Land Registration Act. Um, that's our main contribution towards the IT. Um, that helps um, the IT provider because it's something they don't have to build. Uh, it also offers value for money because there's no duplication of cost. In terms of the more general general point, I would have to pass over to Eleanor or Al Al Alison for that. There are two things I should say. First of all, Registers of Scotland will not be self-financing around the work that it does on tax. It will be paid by Revenue Scotland for the work that it does and that will be therefore transparent to the Parliament. Um, the second thing is that we are looking at annual operating costs for Revenue Scotland, Ross and SEPA uh, for the taxes of the order of £3.5 million pounds a year against um, estimates of £550 million or more of the tax revenue likely to be collected. So I think we're a long way from the point where you might have to worry about whether it was efficient to collect them. Well, I've heard that before. Have you revised your estimates uh, of payments to Ross? I have not, in fact, revised my estimates of payment to Rose. So you're quite content with the cost of their IT systems and the difficulties they've R had in Rose getting to this place? Rose is not developing the IT system here. Revenue Scotland is developing the IT system itself. Right. With your rising costs. Okay. Okay.
Colin Keir. Thank you, convener, and good morning. Um, I think there, there's some degree of paranoia sometimes within the, our committees due to periodic um, discussions over other IT systems which have gone pear-shaped. Uh, I would probably suspect the HMRC £3 billion mess up um, uh, dwarfs most things. Um, in fact, I, I think at this minute, having looked at Exhibit 3 and the um, uh, Auditor General's report and the fact that if you can get from the beginning to the end in the manner that you're uh, talking at this moment in time, you'd probably be the most successful IT st setup we've seen in many, many years uh, in public service. Um, and I would at least, uh, if that happens, I'll be the first to commend you. Um, going back, I said earlier on, one of the things that had actually impressed me, perhaps not others, but had done uh, with me was, and particularly on having the record of you know, wastage that HMRC had, particularly with the three billion uh, uh, lost, is actually the fact that he identified relatively early on that this was better to be an external project uh, development than one in-house. Could you tell us exactly, um, and this is where obviously the, the um, delay uh, is identified in this report at this time has come through. Could you tell us just the, the evaluation process what you came, or why you came to the decision you did, just to give us a clearer idea of the, the questions that you were asking uh, at that time, so you could make a, uh, this evaluation. So this is the evaluation to, that, that led to us deciding to go to the external contract? Yes. yes. Um, so we, we worked very fully through our requirements with the Scottish Government IT team, um, so they understood we had been doing the very detailed business analysis work um, to, to specify requirements really from the summer of uh, 2013 when, um, when, when uh, we were working on the finalisation of the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill, working alongside colleagues. We'd done a lot of work on this. We then were working with Scottish Government IT team to make sure they understood that fully and we understood whether they were in the best position uh, to take this work on. Um, it was in the end a mutual decision that it was better for them to take a role supporting us through procurement and supporting us through working with an external contractor than taking this on directly themselves um, because of the capacity reasons and their other, the other demands on them. Um, and the capacity constraint is about making sure that if anything requires us to scale up effort at any point during the programme, that there is enough, it's not just about enough people to do the work, but enough people to respond to anything that might come up during the course of the work. Mm -hmm. So it was all done for the best of reasons uh, in terms of uh, cost effectiveness. Um, and reducing risk. And, reduce, and reducing risk, of course. Um, it takes you into the risk, better to be risk aware than risk averse thing, yeah. or is the other way or whatever. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the other thing in terms of the timeline, obviously from where the Auditor General set this report and when it had to be published and whatever, to a certain extent there's been so much in the way of information that's come out recently, such as the First Minister's statement last Thursday, that we're kind of looking at a different scenario right now than we are uh, at that point. There's nothing un absolutely wrong with the Auditor General's report. It was for a time. Um, but we have to be aware that um, a lot of these risks that have been put down here are actually being dealt with. And as you see, even from even the First Minister's statement last week, things have moved on quite uh, uh, quickly. In indeed. Um, I mean, the position on risk now is considerably different to the point where the Auditor General staff were doing the work. Um, there. I would say the risks are considerably lower at this point than they were when that when that work was being done. Okay, well, look, I, I understand the time. I've got a few okay. other things, but okay. I'll leave it there. Uh, Tavi Scott and then Gil Patterson. Thank you very much. I wonder if I could start by asking the uh, Director General uh, when the government made an appointment in terms of the head of Revenue Scotland. Was that an internal board or was that an external recruitment exercise? 
um, it was a posting into the role. Um, so um, the head of Revenue Scotland was um, brought in on a proportionate basis across um, Director of Financial Strategy and Head of Revenue Scotland, recognising there would be a, a start point and a ramping up of capacity. So it's getting the balance between the people that were needed and also the costs. Was it an external was it an external exercise or was it an internal is it was it internal, is that what you've just described? It's internal, yes. Yeah, there was no external recruitment of this to this post. That's right. There's a reason for that? Is that normal at this level, for a very senior job in the Scottish Civil Service? Um, I think it's about um, recognising there are different phases when That's you're creating... I want to know, is that a normal process in terms of a senior job like this in the Civil Service? Um, in terms of individual posts, they're assessed according to the actual posts at the particular time. So it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, uh, can I just go back to the convener's question about the evidence that you gave on the 26th of uh, November, uh, Head of Revenue, uh, uh, Ms. Emerson, uh, to the Finance Committee, in which you said to Gavin Brown, you've already mentioned it, uh, there's been a lot of progress, but there's nothing negative that I need to report. You said that at the same time as knowing there was an Audit Scotland report which showed that risk had increased, didn't you? Um, I... I knew that there was an Audit Scotland report due to come out, and I had some expectations of what it might say. Well, you signed it off. You'd factually signed it off. Um, I didn't factually sign off the Auditor General's assessment of risk. I, I, I have agreed the facts of dates and numbers on which all of this is based. The Auditor General, as she's already said, reached her own conclusions. About which you don't risk. agree with? Uh, so I don't share her perception of risk. You don't agree with her? And therefore, you felt quite obliged to tell Parliament there's, there's nothing negative that you needed to report to the Finance Committee on the 26th of November. I, I said there was nothing negative I needed to report in terms of what had changed between my written report to the committee in mid-October and what happened at the and end And you didn't of feel obliged to tell the Finance Committee anything else that might be of interest to them at that time in front of a parliamentary committee of this Parliament? They asked me about um, levels of... They asked me about progress. They asked me about red, amber, green. I declared that we had a number of areas at amber. That would indicate active management, active risks and active management of risk. I thought I gave them a fair picture of... Well, you think a fair picture progress. saying that there's nothing negative I need to report? Do you think that's a fair picture? In terms of the question I was asked, yes. My, my. Um, can I ask, uh, in that case, um, when, if you don't think risk has increased and you disagree with that conclusion, uh, how are we meant to make an assessment of what you're saying today? Um, we, have, we have audits got in front of us every, every couple of weeks, and they don't say these things lightly, and you're a senior civil servant basically saying they're wrong. Why should we believe you? Well, you can believe me on staffing, because I'm telling you now the numbers of staff that we have in place. And you can believe me on IT because I tell you that I have a system in testing. I have seen it. I've seen demo of it. We will have external people coming in to test it in January. You will be able to see whether all of that remains on track. So there's nothing to worry about, and we can be perfectly clear that it'll all be perfect on the 1st of April. You can be sure that we're on track to deliver for the 1st of April, and you can be sure that I am on top of working out if there are any problems and any actions I need to take to deal with. Them. That's just a session for t in terms of today, isn't it? Because I'm the Auditor General is saying something different. The, who, who am I meant to believe? I, well, I'm asking you to believe me, but I... Uh... I have no questions to add to this. Nothing. Okay. Um, Gil Patterson, Sandra White. Thanks, Just a slightly uh, different direction. Uh, that, uh, looking at the uh, Auditor General's report and... In the report, she talks about the Scottish and UK ministers are still to agree the adjustments to the block grant uh, for the development of taxes. And then goes on to further say that the Scottish Government has assumed that the reduction of the block grant in 2015-16 will allow it to meet the funding requirements of its budget and potentially establish the first payment into the cash reserves. And I wondered if you had any uh, information for the committee if this assumption by the government wasn't met, if there's implications in what they may well be. So, um, just in terms of the block grant adjustment, um, I can say that there has been some progress on that. Um, 
we, we now can see that, obviously, with the Chancellor making his statement in the autumn statement at the beginning of December about changing the approach by the UK government, <coughs> excuse me, to the Scottish, to the, um, the stamp duty land tax in, set by the UK government, that that has obviously been a delaying factor in being able to actually agree the block grant adjustment because the data that would be um, used as a basis for agreeing a block grant adjustment will be sensitive to whatever is the actual forecast of tax from a UK perspective in 2015-16. So I can report that there has been some active progress now since the autumn statement. Officials have followed up and there have been discussions between UK and Scottish ministers and I would expect there to be an agreement in place by the time that uh, further material has to come forward to Parliament on the budget in January. So, and it will be at that point that both Scottish ministers and the Parliament will be able to assess the extent to which the block grant adjustment and the assumptions that were being made when we had to set out the draft budget in October this year actually can be, can be delivered or adjusted as appropriately. D does, that, does that make it uh, cash neutral in, in a sense, that what you've described? by um, using this adjustment or, or is there a potential for the Scottish Government to lose revenue in this deal? Um, the, the principles obviously were set out at the time of the draft budget, actually looking for that um, neutral position and also including something that would go into the cash reserve. Um, it will have to be the final analysis of the block grant adjustment that will determine what that actually means in practice. But I think um, the feedback we are getting is that we're expecting there to be um, the adjustment for 2015-16 agreed in time for us to be able to deal with the necessary and normal budgetary processes in Parliament in the turn of the year. OK, thanks very much. Thanks, Kevin. OK, Sandra White. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. C can we establish what one thing? I think everyone has agreed this, that this is a, a large and complex issue. It's been a moving feast, as I said previously, and with the Smith Commission and extra powers, etc., the implementation of this report was taking place during that process. So that's established, I believe. So I, I just want to establish that, and I want to uh, go forward with what the report has said uh, regarding... I think, Ms Emerson, you mentioned the fact that the figures in the report, the factual accuracy, yes, you'd agreed with that, you'd saw that. It's conclusions which have been come about from the Auditor-General, which you would say that you wouldn't necessarily, I don't want to use the word agree with, but the perception you have is slightly different. So can I take you through some of the Auditor-General's report uh, here? The first one, it says, there is a risk that Revenue Scotland will not fill all of its original posts in, t in line with its plans, although it does mention in Phase 2, staff in post by the end of February 2015, as originally estimated. Can you tell the committee, will these posts be filled in time for 2015? We'll have... We will have all the posts. We will have all the people that we need for the 1st of April in order to uh, d collect the taxes. As I mentioned earlier, we currently have filled 21 of 40 operational posts. We have eight more that are in a recruitment process. Three with interviews scheduled. Five just slightly <laughs> earlier in the process than that. That will leave us 11 that we're advertising in the new year. Um, we, I have no reason to believe we won't have all the people we need. It might be important to mention that although we have a plan to bring people in by in February. Um, we, there's already been discussion in front of the Committee of Critical Path. Um, that second phase of, of, that, um, of 20 posts, or indeed the last 11 I've mentioned, that we have still to recruit, they're not on the critical path. We don't have to have all 40 in order to go live successfully on the 1st of April. And I minded have picked up on it, I think it was yourself that said as well, that to, or it may have been even the Auditor General's report, uh, to recruit 40 staff all at the one time would not be beneficial to this particular issue. It would need to be done in phases, is that yeah, correct? That's correct, yes. We move on now to the second part where the Auditor General report says there is a risk that the IT system for collecting the devolved taxes will not be fully Im implemented, although in paragraph 27 it says... The Auditor General's report says this may have consequences. It doesn't say, well, this may have consequences. Can I ask if you can say to the committee what the situation is with the IT system? Will this be up and running for 2015? 
So, as I've already um, mentioned, the IT system is currently in internal testing. And in January, we'll move to testing with external people. That's people who will eventually be users of the system, will come in to help us with the testing. Um, we then, um, you can have a high degree of confidence once all that testing has been done and we've addressed any issues that arise that we will be ready to go live on the 1st of April. Okay, that, that's that other one. And the other one I wanted to check was there has been talk about uh, basically revenue costs and, and, you know, the rising costs and the Auditor General, not the Auditor General itself, but one of the um, panel with the Auditor General when asked by Mary Scanlon, I think Mary put it up to four million. That was in a three year period, so it was 1.1 million over cost. But we also have the fact that uh, HMRC in paragraph 46 of the Auditor General's report, I think it's page 17, uh, is actually a, a saving. There's a downward cost of between five and £10 million. Pounds. The question I wanted to ask uh, to yourselves is, this money which is going to be saved, it's the Auditor General mentions it, would that be assumed into the overall running costs of the, the, the project that we're looking at just now? And that is a saving. Um, well, the, the savings in, um, that, that come from um, the, the reduction in costs from HMRC are considerably larger than um, increased costs for Revenue Scotland. Um, they will flow back to um, Scottish Government to be allocated to other public services, as you would expect. Okay. I just wanted to make that point, because it is a substantial saving, yeah. £10 million, pounds, compared to 1.1 of the rise. So I think that uh, you know, is a positive aspect of it. Uh, but thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, sorry, it, was that about the Scottish rate of income tax, that, that bit of it? Right, yes. rather than, yeah, okay. Um, Nigel Don and then Mary Scanlon. And, and apologies for not being there at the very beginning, though I, I don't think I miss much, but if I am repeating my apologies, and I'm sure people will point this out. Um, I'd just like to go back. You have uh, made comments about the critical path, which I did raise earlier. Um, I'd just like to come back to that. Um, I'm grateful for your comments about the staff not being on the critical path. Am I right in thinking, uh, and this is implied, I have to say, by Exhibit 2 on page 9, that on the 1st of April you will not suddenly find that everybody wants to send you a tax return, that actually what will happen is those who happen to have bought or sold properties, whoever it is is responsible for doing this, will relate to, will send you something relating to that particular transaction and the ones that have happened on that day and, and so there will be a relatively steady stream of transactions that you have to deal with rather than a pile of them suddenly arriving like the Christmas Post. Um, I mean, there, there, we know from our colleagues in Registers of Scotland who've been in this business for many years that there are seasonal fluctuations in the property right. market. Um, we are expecting somewhere between 450 and 600 uh, tax returns per working day on average during the year, but it will vary. We're planning for go live on, on the possibility that it might be significantly higher, just so that we are ready for right. any possible spike on the 1st of April. And we think there could be up to 800 um, on the first day, just due to a combination of factors right. in the transition between the taxes and the help to buy scheme. But, and this really is my point, if this is a relatively steady stream, albeit there are bound to be fluctuations, if it so happens that on the 1st of April this doesn't quite work, you can process those manually and then get it running on the 2nd or the 3rd or whatever. In other words, uh, the, the question really is, is this a soft landing, as I think it is, or is there some genuinely <coughs> critical date at which, frankly, it's got to work or we are in trouble? We absolutely have to have a means of collecting the tax and processing the tax returns from the 1st of April. Yep. If it had to be a paper-based system for a period of time, we could certainly make that work and, and still deliver a good service and still make sure the money was in the door. But that's not what we're planning to do. Right. In which case, glad to hear that. Can I then come back to the idea of critical paths, which are always a bit of a problem when you're having to test stuff, because that's part of the process and it is because you never quite get it right it does need to be tweaked but you never know how long that's going to take how meaningful therefore is some kind of critical path analysis which I'm sure you've got uh, in this case and and how where do you derive your confidence from 
Um, a, a whole range of factors. I mean, the fact that we measure, monitor progress and assess risks regularly, weekly, as we have been doing, um, I, I draw confidence from the fact that if anything were, were to come up that I haven't foreseen, that we're not planning for, that we do have a contingency plan. Mm -hmm. um, I draw confidence from the fact that I've actually seen the IT system, which of course is an advantage I have over, over everyone else in this discussion, perhaps. Um, so, and I draw confidence from the fact that I know where we stand on staff recruitment. I work with the staff. I know where we are. Yeah. Okay. But it's a computer project. It's, it's a an computer. IT project. It's an IT and project, yes. Um, until we have completed full testing, you're right. We're, we're, but that would be the case no matter how much time we had or yes. no matter where we were. Um, you can't know until the very end when you've done all the testing and you're sure that the system is ready. Um, but but we ha I have no reason to believe other than that we will be ready for the 1st of April. I'm not actually doubting that, but I wanted you to put that on the record yeah, because it's a tendency to believe that an IT system is a bit like a car and once you've put all the bits in the right place and you put the petrol in, it's going to work. <laughs> actually, you know, it, may yeah. not, it may not be like that and we need to understand that. I agree. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mary Scanlon? We've got no reason to believe that it won't be collected on the 1st of April, but we're facing a report with an increased risk of your ability to collect on the 1st of April. Two weeks ago at the Audit Committee, it was just when you responded to Tavi Scott about your testing in January. Yes. But also, um, Ms. Emerson, you said, it is our intention uh, to do in February and March what you would describe as a layperson, uh, taking your words, would describe as snagging, making absolutely sure that there's no little glitches. Now, the truth is that you may have little glitches, you may have big glitches. You don't, the truth is you don't know. If you're facing snagging, which you tell the Finance Committee, how can you be absolutely sure and totally confident that we won't all be sitting writing out uh, 800 transactions. So what I informally described as snagging is formally described as a restricted testing environment. So the system, when fully tested by through user acceptance testing in January, is then made available to a group of people who will eventually be users of the system. And they, I'm told, uh, I, can, I can use language like play with it. <laughs> and make sure that um, there isn't anything else that we might have missed anywhere in the testing. It's not that we anticipate that there will be, it's simply, it's good practice. It's what you would expect me to do at that stage in an IT project. We stop doing system development and we make absolutely sure that, that the system works. So you can sit here today and say that in February and March, these people will be playing with the system and you can guarantee with confidence that any snagging and any glitches, be it small or large, will all be overcome and all will be well in the 1st of April. That's what you're saying. Yeah. I, I believe that is my belief of what will happen, yes. Right. So, so okay, you, you know what's coming. You know exactly what the glitches may be. You know what the snagging may be. You know what's going to come forward in the testing. But as a lay person, you've uh, as you see here to the audit yes. uh, finance committee, you will overcome all that, and with confidence, will be up and running on the first of April. That is what we are working to achieve. We have very, very thorough plans. We have very thorough testing plans. We have a good contractor. We are on track. We heard that two years ago. If you'll forgive me, I don't think you heard that we had a contractor or we were doing system development two years ago. I think we heard that Rose had certain problems that had been highlighted over many years and they're, they're essential to the success as well. I think if I, sorry, I'll, I'll join in then, Alison, sorry. Okay. I think just if I may add, in terms of ROS, yeah, we, we, we do appreciate we were in front of this committee some two years ago. Um, since then, we have very much um, learnt from the, the managing ICT contract report that Audit Scotland produced. Um, I can give you more than assurances that we have taken on board their comments about governance, um, financial budgeting, um, intelligent client functions. Um, over the last two years, we have delivered um, 
on two major pieces of Scottish Parliament legislation. We delivered the Crofting Register um, at the end of November 2012, and then a week passed on Monday, we delivered a range of new systems to support the new Land Registration Scotland Act. Um, much of the discussion has been around the, uh, the sort of progress and the planning um, in terms of um, delivering new systems. It's, for any IT system, it is complex. It was always subject to some degree of change. Um, but what's important is having a, a plan, an action if the plan has to be deviated from, uh, a way of managing risks and a way of managing dependencies as well. Um, as a member of the, the Tax Administration Programme Board, I have a dual role. I have a one role as a, a supplier. Uh, ROS has to supply certain um, functions in order for the tax to go live. In terms of IT, our main um, piece of equipment that we have to supply is already ready and has been tested by um, the, the firm that's producing the, the eventual IT system. So it's in place. So I can give you a reassurance around that. Um, our other main rules are around the, the policing of the new tax. That's a role we currently carry out in terms of stamp duty and land tax. So it's something we already do uh, and we're already very well prepared for. Um, so it's just to give some reassurances. ROS has very much learnt from its, um, you know, its experiences before this committee and we have put that learning into to active practice, certainly for the benefit of our customers and we hope the, the wider Scottish um, public. Um, can I ask um, a couple of things? Uh, uh, Alison Stafford, I don't know if it's yourself or, or, or Eleanor Emerson that, that, that's responsible for this, but um, what plans do the various agencies have to report annually on their performance in areas of the various areas of tax compliance? So we're, we're developing at the moment what our performance reporting framework should be. Um, we we want to make sure that um, we're as transparent as we can possibly be. So you, we will obviously be producing reports that will um, explain the, the volumes of, of uh, returns that we've uh, cases that we have dealt with and the and the amount of money collected. But we're we're um, keen to ensure that you can understand what return we're getting from the compliance work that we do, and um, also very keen to work with the committee on what kind of reports it would find helpful. So that there'll be annual returns from each of the agencies on things like uh, tax collection, debt management, debt losses, value of tax, secured compliance yield, levels of error and fraud, and so on. That'll all be reported annually. It will certainly be reported annually. We have been working on the assumption that the committee would want information more frequently than annually and yeah. that we would need to work with you on what sort of okay. schedule of reporting would be helpful. Right. That's, that's helpful. Um, last question. Um, what's the, the last date or the latest date by which um, you would have to decide to use the contingency plan? As we've now developed it, uh, it would be around the end of February. And will you notify this committee if there's any intention of uh, using that contingency? If that is what the committee would like us to do, then yes, of That course. would be helpful. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. I know you've got a, a hectic uh, morning. You're, you're now going to the, the Finance Committee, but uh, that's been very useful. Thank you for your time. OK, thank you. Can I quickly move on... Um, to sec item 4, section 22 reports. Um, the committee has written submissions from the Scottish Government and NHS Orkney on the Auditor General for Scotland reports. Um, now, we can... Uh, you know, I'm in the hands of, of, of committee members. You can either note the submissions or you could request further written or oral evidence. Now, committee members should uh, be aware that we are taking evidence on the 2nd of February in Inverness from NHS uh, Highland and also we're taking evidence from the Scottish Government on the NHS in Scotland on the report on the 14th of January. So you could decide to defer consideration of whether to take any evidence from the Scottish Government until after the evidence sessions, or you could indeed highlight any issues or comments to the Health and 
uh, sport committee, so it's for members to decide which option. Colin? Can I, can I suggest that, uh, the suggestion you made uh, is very sensible that we defer the decision until after we've actually taken evidence from NHS okay. Grampian and the government. Is that agreed? Yes, I agree. Yeah. Right. Um, well, just before I go into private session, can I intimate to committee members that I will be moving on from my post as convener of the Public Audit Committee. Um, the, the inevitable political reshuffles that, that take place in, in all parties uh, ha, has occurred, uh, and I'm moving to a new role. Um, can I thank the, the members of the Audit Committee, both the present members, some of whom have recently come to the committee, and also uh, the other members that I've served with uh, over the piece, as, uh, as always, the Public Audit Committee is a, is a stimulating and, and interesting uh, committee. It's one that I think uh, usually adds value uh, to the work of the Parliament. Uh, I've made the comment before that I do think that committees of this Parliament need to uh, watch that they don't become complacent, that we have a role to play in holding the government of the day, whatever the political complexion of that government is, to account and committees need to be robust and vigorous otherwise we are letting down not only the committee um, but the, the parliament but I think the public audit committee has uh, a commendable uh, track record uh, over the years. can also thank uh, Jane and her team, both the present team and uh, her, her previous team um, they have been exceptionally diligent uh, and hard working and have kept me right on many occasions and, and that I, I, I do appreciate so uh, thank you very much Mary Scanlon I just wonder convener if you would allow me to uh, just to say a few words uh, uh, perhaps as deputy convener on behalf of the committee but can I just say when I came here in 1999 and you were sitting there as the arch socialist on the health committee and I was the token Tory I never actually uh, imagined that would be sitting here uh, working uh, so well uh, still, it's still an art socialist, and I'm still a token Tory uh, on the audit committee. But I, I, I just wanted to thank you. I mean, this I think this committee is very special. It's about scrutinising government of whatever colour and organisations, and it's I, I enjoy it so much because it's all about the money and the effective spend, the value for money, and uh, it really doesn't matter that you're the art socialist and I'm the token Tory because this is not about politics, it's about spending taxpayers' money and I just want to say that it's no mistake that you've been nominated and become the politician of the year for several years because I think you have done an excellent job. I don't know whether your uh, successor will have the Rockweiler qualities that you have um, but uh, I, I do hope that we will uh, get someone that takes on board the approach that you've had but um, I think the whole part Parliament respects the job that you've done uh, on this committee and uh, I just want to say from my point of view uh, it's been a tremendous pleasure working for you and I think we have done very good work on this committee and I know it will continue. Thank you Mary, I'm sure you meant Rockwell qualities as a compliment. I did, but, uh, I did. The, the, the one thing that, that I, uh, I neglected to mention that, uh, and I'll bring Colin Beatty in in a moment. Uh, sorry? Sorry. The, the one, uh, thank you, Mary, for, for, for your comments. Um, the one thing that uh, I did neglect to mention, um, and I think it underpins all of the work, the committee members have a, a tremendous role to play. The staff that support the committee are, are, are fantastic. But actually, we couldn't do any of this work without the quality of reports that yeah. come to the committee from Audit Scotland. Yeah. And I, I think over the years, not only myself, but other conveners, um, have paid tribute to that work, both um, Caroline Gardner and her team and her predecessor, Bob Black. Um, the, the work is exceptional. It's the, of the highest professional quality. It's incise and it's concise, which I, I think is, is always very helpful. Uh, and, and frankly, we couldn't do our work uh, without that input from Audit Scotland. Sorry, Colin Beatty. Just, just to add congratulations on your elevation and uh, to wish you well on your, Thank you. In your new post. Uh, we'll miss you. 
uh, but I seem to recall this is the, in my time on the committee. This is your second departure. Yeah. <laughs> might be back. Yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully, yeah, through the heart. we'll go on to greater things. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. And with that, we will move into private session. <laughs>